Geologists feared that samples obtained from the crater might have been contaminated by the Imbrium impact, thus preventing Apollo 16 from obtaining samples of pre-Imbrium material. There also remained the distinct possibility that this objective would have already been satisfied by the Apollo 14 and Apollo 15 missions, as the Apollo 14 samples had not yet been completely analyzed and samples from Apollo 15 had not yet been obtained. On June 3, 1971, the Site Selection Committee decided to target the Apollo 16 mission for the Descartes site. Following the decision, the Alphonsus site was considered the most likely candidate for Apollo 17, but was eventually rejected. With the assistance of orbital photography obtained on the Apollo 14 mission, the Descartes site was determined to be safe enough for a crewed landing. The specific landing site was between two young impact craters, North Ray and South Ray craters 1,680 meters in diameter, respectively, which provided natural drill holes, which penetrated through the lunar regolith at the site, thus leaving exposed bedrock that could be sampled by the crew. Mission planners made the Descartes and Cayley formations, two geologic units of the lunar highlands, the primary sampling interest of the mission. It was these formations that the scientific community widely suspected were formed by lunar volcanism, but this hypothesis was proven incorrect by the composition of lunar samples from the mission. In addition to the usual Apollo spacecraft training, Young and Duke, along with backup commander Fred Hayes, underwent an extensive geological training program that included several field trips to introduce them to concepts and techniques they would use in analyzing features and collecting samples on the lunar surface. The backup LMP, Mitchell, was unavailable during the early part of the training, occupied with tasks relating to Apollo 14, that by September 1971 had joined the geology field trips. Tony England or one of the geologist trainers would train alongside Hayes on geology field trips. Since Descartes was believed to be volcanic, a good deal of this training was geared towards volcanic rocks and features, but field trips were made to sites featuring other sorts of rock. As Young later commented, the non-volcanic training proved more useful, given that Descartes did not prove to be volcanic. In July 1971, they visited Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, for geology training exercises, the first time U.S. astronauts trained in Canada. The Apollo 14 landing crew had visited a site in West Germany. Geologist Don Wilhelms related that unspecified incidents there had caused Slayton to rule out further European training trips. The Sudbury Basin shows evidence of shatter cone geology, familiarizing the Apollo crew with geologic evidence of a meteorite impact. During the training exercises the astronauts did not wear spacesuits, but carried radio equipment to converse with each other in England, practicing procedures they would use on the lunar surface. By the end of the training, the field trips had become major exercises, involving up to eight astronauts and dozens of support personnel, attracting coverage from the media. For the exercise at the Nevada test site, where the massive craters left by nuclear explosions simulated the large craters to be found on the moon, all participants had to have security clearance and a listed next of kin, and an overflight by CMP Mattingly required special permission. In addition to the field geology training, Young and Duke also trained to use their EVA spacesuits, adapt to the reduced lunar gravity, collect samples, and drive the lunar roving vehicle. The fact that they had been backups for Apollo 13, planned to be a landing mission, meant that they could spend about 40% of their time training for their surface operations. They also received survival training and prepared for technical aspects of the mission. The astronauts spent much time studying the lunar samples brought back by earlier missions, learning about the instruments to be carried on the mission, and hearing what the principal investigators in charge of those instruments expected to learn from Apollo 16. This training helped Young and Duke, while on the moon, quickly realize that the expected volcanic rocks were not there, even though the geologists in mission control initially did not believe them. Mattingly also received training in recognizing geological features from orbit by flying over the field areas in an airplane, and trained to operate the scientific instrument module from lunar orbit. The launch vehicle which took Apollo 16 to the moon was a Saturn V, designated as S-511. Apollo 16's Saturn V was almost identical to Apollo 15's. One change that was made was the restoration of four retro rockets to the SIC first stage, meaning there would be a total of eight, as on Apollo 14 and earlier. The retro rockets were used to minimize the risk of collision between the jettisoned first stage and the Saturn V. These four retro rockets had been omitted from Apollo 15's Saturn V to save weight, but analysis of Apollo 15's flight showed that the SIC came closer than expected after jettison, and it was feared that if there were only four rockets and one failed, there might be a collision. As on all lunar landing missions after Apollo 11, an Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments package was flown on Apollo 16. 
This was a suite of nuclear-powered experiments designed to keep functioning after the astronauts who set them up returned to Earth. The PSE added to the network of seismometers left by Apollo 12, 14 and 15. NASA intended to calibrate the Apollo 16 PSE by crashing the LM's ascent stage near it after the astronauts were done with it, an object of known mass and velocity impacting at a known location. NASA lost control of the ascent stage after jettison, and this did not occur. The ASE, designed to return data about the moon's geologic structure, consisted of two groups of explosives, one, a line of thumpers, were to be deployed attached to three geophones. A second group was four mortars of different sizes, to be set off remotely once the astronauts had returned to Earth. Apollo 14 had also carried an ASE, though its mortars were never set off for fear of affecting other experiments. The HFE involved the drilling of two 3.0 meters holes into the lunar surface and emplacement of thermometers which would measure how much heat was flowing from the lunar interior. This was the third attempt to emplace a HFE, the first flew on Apollo 13 and never reached the lunar surface, while on Apollo 15, problems with the drill meant the probes did not go as deep as planned. The Apollo 16 attempt would fail after Duke had successfully emplaced the first probe. Young, unable to see his feet in the bulky spacesuit, pulled out and severed the cable after it wrapped around his leg. The HFE flew, and was successfully deployed, on Apollo 17. The LSM was designed to measure the strength of the moon's magnetic field, which is only a small fraction of Earth's. Additional data would be returned by the use of the Lunar Portable Magnetometer, to be carried on the lunar rover and activated at several geology stops. Scientists also hoped to learn from an Apollo 12 sample, to be briefly returned to the Moon on Apollo 16, from which soft magnetism had been removed, to see if it had been restored on its journey. Measurements after the mission found that soft magnetism had returned to the sample, although at a lower intensity than before. A far ultraviolet camera, spectrograph was flown, the first astronomical observations taken from the Moon, seeking data on hydrogen sources in space without the masking effect of the Earth's corona. The instrument was placed in the LM's shadow and pointed at nebulae, other astronomical objects, the Earth itself, and any suspected volcanic vents seen on the lunar surface. When asked to summarize the results for a general audience, Dr. George Carruthers of the Naval Research Laboratory stated, the most immediately obvious and spectacular results were really for the Earth observations, because this was the first time that the Earth had been photographed from a distance in ultraviolet light, so that you could see the full extent of the hydrogen atmosphere, the polar auroras and what we call the tropical airglow belt. Four panels mounted on the LM's descent stage comprised the cosmic ray detector, designed to record cosmic ray and solar wind particles. Three of the panels were left uncovered during the voyage to the Moon, with the fourth uncovered by the crew early in the EVA the panels would be bagged for return to Earth. The freestanding solar wind composition experiment flew on Apollo 16, as it had on each of the lunar landings, for deployment on the lunar surface and return to Earth. The Apollo 16 Particles and Fields subsatellite was a small satellite released into lunar orbit from the service module. Its principal objective was to measure charged particles and magnetic fields all around the Moon as the Moon orbited Earth, similar to its sister spacecraft, PFS-1, released eight months earlier by Apollo 15. The two probes were intended to have similar orbits, ranging from 89 to 122 kilometers above the lunar surface. 